Hello everyone. In this video record hey. In this video record <coughs> Hello everyone. In this lecture recording, I want to talk a bit about first century Judaism. This is very much a talk um, that I want you just to sit back and listen to, kind of like with the textual criticism one, so it's not a talk where you need to take notes or memorize anything. It's really to get us kind of all on the same page regarding um, imp certain Jewish concepts and groups that are important for reading the New Testament in a first century context. I am assuming that much of this will be familiar to you either through previous course in Hebrew scriptures or through um, the catechesis material, particularly the level 3 material. So some of this is, uh, is going to be a review, some of it is going to um, perhaps bring in some uh, text resources that you um, may need some more familiarity with. So I'm going to start out by looking at some of the main tenets within Judaism um, and then take a walk through um, the covenants and um, the various uh, groups, the Jewish groups that were more prominent in the New Testament. So we're looking here, I've got some pictures accompanying each of the slides. Um, this is a very beautiful mosaic from a synagogue about five miles north of Jericho. The synagogue dates from the sixth century. Um, what's wonderful, however, is that it's it's lifting up um, some of the things that the symbols that are strongly associated or have always been strongly associated with ancient Judaism. So you have the menorah, the seven branch lampstand, for which we have directions of how to build in, um, in the Torah. Underneath the menorah, um, you have the shofar, the ram's horn, which was blown, calling all people to, um, to uh, worship at the temple. And then on the left side you have a palm branch, it's called a lulaf, and this palm branch would have been wrapped up with a couple of other specific branches um, and used during the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Sukkot, which we'll look more closely at um, once we do the Transfiguration um, and we are in John's Gospel. Underneath is an inscription that reads Peace upon Israel. So this synagogue was destroyed in its entirety except for the mosaic floor, and this is just a cutout for the mosaic floor. So I'd like to begin with what I call um, the seven pillars of Judaism. These are seven things that stand out in the Jewish mind that are very prominent as far as concepts or ideas or beliefs or traditions that play a strong role and we see them revived or referred to at least um, in the New Testament. The first one, these years should all be familiar with anyway, is monotheism, that there is only one God. Um, and we hear about that for the first time at the biblical level with Abraham, when Abraham is called out of his polytheistic environment and called to follow just the one God. The monarchy, that Israel will be led by a king um, it will be an everlasting kingship, um, and it can, the kingship comes through the house of David. The monarchy is a relatively late development. If you um, will recall, it doesn't happen until we're well in the land of Israel, so after the book of Exodus, uh, once we're outside of um, Joshua and the um, Israelites are settling into the land of Canaan and taking the land. And the intention was always that Israel would only follow God, would only follow Yahweh Lord. Um, but there was such an outcry by the people because they wanted to have a human king and a human leader that God condescended and made this concession, if you will, to have a human leader. And so the house of David becomes that ideal leadership with King David leading Israel in a golden age um, for the people of Israel, but the promise is made that there shall be a king coming from the line of David who will rule Israel forever. The Messiah, third set pillar, is the Messiah that God will raise up an anointed leader, 
Messiah, you know probably well, is um, comes uh, from the Greek, um, which is based on the Hebrew Mashiach, um, which means someone who is anointed, anointed for kingship or anointed, a chosen person by God. God will raise up an anointed leader who will deliver Israel. Um, election, that this people, the Israelites, are a special people. They were chosen by God, chosen to be in a special relationship with God, and that they were to be a holy people. They were to be a sacred people, meaning they were to be set apart from the rest of society according to the laws that they lived, according to the God that they worshipped. They were to be um, not following the secular ways, but rather only the ways that were set out by God. Land, that God promised a land that would be theirs. The law, the law refers both um, to the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, but it also refers to all of Torah, so all of the commandments and ordinances that were given out in Torah and that then were further expounded upon or experienced in some way in the rest of the books of the Old Testament. So the law, when it's referred to um, in the New Testament, we need to keep in mind that it can mean both things. It's the way of life of the Jew who lives according to Torah, meaning lives according to a life with God, or it can refer specifically to the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses. And lastly, the temple, that God will always have a dwelling, a physical dwelling in the midst of his people. The temple, of course, was not built until the time of Solomon, until that time where there was the physical structure of the temple. God dwelled, if you will, um, in the tent of meeting that was set up in the Exodus, and he was dwelt in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, which um, was later on placed into the Holy of Holies inside the Jerusalem temple. So these seven things are at the forefront of the first century Jewish mind. And so we want to be sure that we have those under our skin as we're trying to place ourselves into the listeners um, or the characters that are given to us in each of the Gospels. Next, we want to just be reminded about the covenant. A covenant is some um, special relationship that is established between the God and the human. And we're very familiar with the covenant from the catechesis. That is, it is something that is God's initiative but requires a human response. And it is a special kind of relationship that God has with his human creation. Um, it's characteristically established through love and it's, it's what is in the highest form of a belongingness to God. I think one of the most beautiful quotes that from scripture that illustrate it is that very tender and loving declaration, you shall be my people and I shall be you God. We need to remember covenant is never established between two humans. It's something that is sealed by God and that it's not a promise of services. Rather, it's based in relationship and very much the underpinning or the foundation for covenant comes out of the goodness of creation as, as established in the book of Genesis. There are four major covenants that I just want to walk us through again because these are references that are made in the New Testament, <clears throat> the covenants or, these, um, or the figures with Noah and Abraham, Moses and the Israelites, and David. So we'll first look at Noah. The covenant with Noah is um, most explicitly described in Genesis 6 through 9. Each of the covenants are signaled with a promise and then a sign of that promise. So the promise is part of what it is God's initiative. The promise for Noah is that God will not destroy the earth again, and that's in Genesis um, chapter 9, verses 8 through 11. And then there is a sign that accompanies the promise, and namely it's the bow in the sky, or as we understand it, the rainbow in the sky. The Hebrew calls it a bow. It, the bow refers to something that is of an arced shape, and it's an especially important word not because of the rainbow so much, but because this word is also used much later in the book of Revelation 
to describe the bow that the rider carries on the white horse. This is the rider that's understood to be the divine figure um, of Jesus, most likely, who is out there conquering all evil once and for all. And, it car and he is holding a bow and using a bow in his attacks. And it's the same word that is used in the Greek that is referring also to the bow um, in the sky with um, Genesis. So I want to keep that in mind. Here also just a quick reference to an orthodox icon showing that moment of the covenant relationship or the sign being produced or having been produced. Um, <clears throat> you'll notice in the bottom right is an altar. Um, one of the human responses always that we see in the Old Testament, the human response to God is the building of an altar and making a sacrifice. This is such a prominent theme and, it's in, and such an almost automatic response among the patriarchs that as soon as something that has happened that is a divine encounter of some sort, the response of the human is to make a sacrifice, offer something back to God. And um, I think it's wonderful here in the Orthodox tradition that they have picked that up um, with the image of the altar. Next, Abraham. Abraham, the covenant, is outlined um, specifically in chapters 12, 15, and 17 of Genesis. The promise that God gives to Abraham, he gives it to him when he's still Avram. Remember, Abraham undergoes the name change, signaling a complete change um, of vocation for Abraham. That the promise includes that he will have numerous descendants, as many as the stars in the sky or the sand in the sea. Um, that he, his descendants will inherit the promised land, and that nations will be blessed through Abraham or through his offspring. So a threefold promise is given by God to Abraham. And the sign of that promise um, is circumcision, that new belongingness shown by the physical mark of circumcision that they belong to, um, uh, that they belong to God or beginning to belong to God in a special way. Next we have the covenant with Moses and the Israelites as outlined in chapters 20 through 34 in the book of Ex Exodus. Um, the images that you see below here are from the um, French painter Marc Chagall, much more of a contemporary view of a Jewish scholar, uh, or Jewish artist, excuse me. And the left one is, of course, Moses at the burning bush, having him um, being where God, Yahweh God, is revealing himself to him, and you can see that that revelation is happening in the left upper corner of the screen with the Hebrew um, letters for the word Yahweh for Lord. And then on the right, um, Moses receiving um, the Ten Commandments from God um, through the cloud, through the cloud that is represents the glory of God um, and the active presence of God. Um, so we have then the promise in this now, we really have the carving out of you are my people, I will be your God. And this is carved out now because God gives then the Israelites the capacity to be in relationship with them by how they live their lives. The way for them to stay in relationship with the Lord is through the following of the law, through the commandments. This is what also sets them apart because these commandments will outline in some ways different expectations of behavior, of social behaviors, than what would be in their polytheistic environment. So they will be set apart and reserved. Ultimately their mission as the people of Israel, yes to be chosen, but to be chosen for a purpose that they shall be an example, a beacon of light, it said, for all other nations to draw, that their purpose is to draw other nations to God as well, in the ultimate sense. So we have then the third covenant with Moses and Israelites, with the sign being the Ten Commandments and the tablets, which were later then housed in the Ark of the Covenant. And finally, the covenant with David. David, this takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 7, and the promise here that is given to David and the Israelites is the royal dynasty having a house through the line of David. House, that's what the Hebrew says, the bait, Dawid, through the house, through the line of David. And the sign then are these numerous descendants from the line of David, as well as the temple. 
Now, if you remember, this was um, at the time when the, the desire for God was really for Israel only to follow him, that there should be no other ruler or no one else before God. But the Israelites made such an uproar when they came into the land of Israel because they saw all their Canaanite neighbors had kings. And so they cried out and said, we would like to have a king too. We would like to have a king too. And there was an argument that ensued because Yahweh said, I'm the only one you should follow. Yahweh eventually did condescend and he then appointed the first king, or the first um, king as King David. And you can see here, and this is a wonderful fresco, which is showing um, the prophet Samuel, who is anointing with the oil, King David as king. He's standing there after he's been chosen next to all of his brothers, the very meager herdsman um, that King David was, yet he was the one that was chosen to lead all of Israel. There was concern on God's part because of what can happen in kingship, and indeed down the line, of course, the monarchy in Israel was split. The northern part of Israel split from the southern part of Israel, Judah, and then the two of them basically were at each other's necks for hundreds of years. Um, this is where we have the language of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and we have a monarchy in each one of them, and it ends up basically falling apart in, um, in two exiles. First an exile of the north to Assyria, and then the major exile to Babylonia, um, focusing specifically on Judah and Jerusalem in the south. So <clears throat> the monarchy had its own problems, um, or the idea of a monarchy had its own problems, and yet we have this promise of a new kingship that will come through the line of David. And of course that promise of the new kingship has an earthly dimension and has a divine dimension as we all know. Now we also have a renewed covenant as described in the book of Jeremiah. The one that describes how God's law will no longer be on tablets but will be written on the hearts of within the people and that the Lord will make this new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And you can see this reflected upon or referred upon in um, the letter, Paul's letter to the Hebrews in chapter 8. The image right here that you have the painting is by Rembrandt. Beautiful painting that is showing Jeremiah. Jerry, you know, when you read the book of Jeremiah, it's, it's in some ways a very dark book because he's constantly giving these messages on the one hand to Israel about how they are just not following God's ways and that it will lead to a certain destruction and then he gives these beautiful signs of hope as in this one, this announcement of the renewed covenant. But here we have kind of the darker side where Jeremiah is at a loss and is contemplating the destruction of Israel, um, the destruction of Judah specifically and the destruction of the temple in 586 before Christ when then all of Israel was in exile. Jesus, of course, then gives us the new covenant. At the Last Supper, the cup is the new covenant, as described in Luke 22, and then reflected upon also, cited by St. Paul in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, Hebrews is a wonderful letter to be reading how all of this language of Judaism that we encounter in, in particularly in the New Testament, especially in something like Matthew, but then how it's also reflected on with Jesus as that high priest and the utmost king and the divine savior as well as the mediator of this new covenant. I highly encourage you to read Hebrews on your own at some time. It's just a wonderful, wonderful, um, uh, very rich, rich letter. Um, so we have finally then the last covenant that is made, or the, the, the fulfillment of the new covenant in Jesus. Now we can turn to um, just briefly some of the Jewish groups that we see um, in the New Testament and that are, we're familiar with from the first century. Um, again, this is something you don't have to memorize. If you like to read this on your own some more, you can look. Much of this comes from Josephus who was um, a Jewish historian and wrote about all the wars that the Jews had and run, then wrote this wonderful long history called the Antiquities of the Jews, starting with creation and going all the way up through his time. Um, and this, um, when he's describing, 
the Jewish groups in the first century. Um, <clears throat> it's from Book 13 of the Antiquities of the Jews. He gives about a paragraph on each one, and then, of course, there are scattered references throughout all of the Antiquities. Well, we first start with this group called the Sadducees that we know very well from the New Testament, the Sadducees. And they probably had their roots from a Zadokite temple priesthood. Zadok was a priest of David. You could find him mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 26. That's um, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 26. And the descendants of Zadok controlled the Jerusalem priesthood from the time of David through the exile, and even um, after, you could see it in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 46. Later on, we hear them as um, tzadikim. The tzadikim, that's a Hebrew word that means the righteous ones. And they seem to have emerged especially as a distinct group in the Maccabean times. So this is the time when the Greeks were ruling over Israel. It was right before the Romans came in. Um, the Greeks were ruling Israel. And this group of the tzadikim... Um, were especially focused in on the temple. They became, however, by the time we get into um, closer to the Roman period, they became much more aligned with the ruling aristocracy, the Hellenized aristocracy, and supposedly had very little in common with the regular people, if you will. So they were, they were much more temple focused, um, and they rejected, strongly rejected other groups in their traditions, such as the Pharisees, which is an interesting point because in the New Testament we always see that the Sadducees and the Pharisees are hooked up together against Jesus. So in the first century, however, our understanding is, is that they really were two groups that opposed one another in their understanding of Judaism or the practice of Judaism, the Sadducees being much more temple-focused the Pharisees being much more Torah-focused. So we'll get to the Pharisees in a second. Um, the Phar First we'll go to the Essenes. Um, the Essenes seem to have emerged as a distinct group around 152 or so BC. Um, they also emerged as in opposition to developments in the temple. And they are th often thought to be identified with Qumran namely Qumran, the site where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and where there seems to have been a community, a somewhat monastic-like community that withdrew from Jerusalem because they were so disgusted about what was happening in the temple structure that they withdrew and formed their own community there. And in that own community, we have this witness, um, whoever left the Dead Sea Scrolls, perhaps it's the Essenes, perhaps it's a different community, Nonetheless, we have this wonderful scriptural witness of copies of the Old Testament, all the writings of the Old Testament, as well as um, writings about living in community life, um, that they clearly practiced celibacy and had a very high state of ritual purity. They had a forbidden participation in anything with the temple. And they had a very strong sense, um, developed sense of waiting for the Messiah that they anticipated the Messiah coming and that that Messiah would usher in this new age and that the Messiah would also then destroy all iniquity that was happening against the, the, these Jews and would punish the enemies, even those enemies that were within Jewish groups and um, were not living according to God's laws. They're a fascinating group. Um, Josephus describes them, the Essenes, as very pious and very dedicated to community life, and everything points to them being um, a monastic group. Then we have the Zealots. I have them in parenthesis or in um, um, in quotes right there because we're not sure that they were a distinct group. Um, the Zealots were someone who, were people who clearly were opposed to the Roman occupation, um, and they seem to have been a nationalistic movement that was led by someone called Judas the Galilean. Um, it's unclear whether this was a distinct group or whether this was simply people who were zealous 
for keeping Judaism, for keeping Torah, and being very much opposed to, um, to the Romans or any kind of occupation of Israel. So I put that in quotes just because it's not entirely clear whether this is an organized group or whether this simply describes people of this particular viewpoint. Then we have the Sicarii. Sicarii are named after the Sicarius, a Latin word for a, a dagger. It's a short knife that, that these people kept hidden inside of their cloaks. They were very anti-Roman, and it was said that they thought nothing of sneaking up behind Roman soldiers and grabbing their Sicarius knife and giving them a stab in order to rid Israel of the Roman occupation. In Josephus, he describes that there was a group of them who were among those who lived um, and held out against the Romans in Matsada. If you remember, Matsada is that rock um, fortress outcropping settlement that is near the Dead Sea that I showed of slides of in a previous um, lecture, um, with a wonderful settlement uh, in the middle of rocky nowhere and that a group of Jews lived up there and held out for many years against the encroaching Roman soldiers. So the Sicarii are one group whom Josephus mentions as also being a Matsada. Just a quick word about the coin that you see here. This image here is of the, the shekel coin. It's a silver coin. Um, it would have been about the size of a quarter um, that was issued by Jewish rebels in the year 68. This is the Jewish rebellion against the Romans that took place from about 66 to about 70 and ended in the destruction of um, the t Jewish temple. On the one side of it, um, there's something that looks somewhat like a chalice or a cup. Um, it is not a chalice as in a drinking cup, um, because of the bulleted line or the the, um, the rim of the cup as you can see is very different and it's actually a, probably a measuring cup that was used to measure out the first offering of grain that was always given back um, to the Lord. So the writing also the inscription around it is written in Paleo Hebrew which is a very ancient form of Hebrew even an old form of Hebrew for the time of first century Judaism and it reads that it's a shekel and it's from um, reads Israel and then the two letters just on top of the the cup read year or an abbreviation for year three meaning it's the third they, this coin was minted in the third year of the revolt the other side um, has the inscription Jerusalem the holy and in the center it's an image of a pomegranate a flowering pomegranate which is a very important and popular symbol within ancient Judaism in particular. Pomegranates were ubiquitous um, and they were known for, um, for being fruitful. That was one of the images they had, but they're strongly associated with the temple. We know that the temple was decorated with um, images of the vine of a pomegranates. So these are two symbols very strongly hearkening of um, Judaism and uh, kind of a, a minting that is very much a pro-Jewish nationalist kind of a minting over against the Romans. Now the shekels were a necess necessity because of paying um, into the temple. The rule was, of course, anything entering or touching or near the temple had to be in a highly pure state. And so when people would make financial offerings to the temple, they had their money, the Greek and Roman money, had to be changed because it was considered a Gentile, and B, it was impure money, not only because it came from the Gentiles, but also because it was not a pure metal. So as you had inflation and deflation of currency in the Greek and Roman empires, so also their pure metal coins would be infiltrated with other metals. So you know you no longer had one metal such as in a gold coin, but then you had smaller denominations with mixed metals. And this was not allowed for um, the temple. So there were currency exchangers. We read about them in that passage where Jesus is overturning the tables of the, the sellers as well as the money changers. These money changers had a place um, near the temple so that people could bring their Gentile currency and exchange it for the shekel, so the shekel then could be the currency given to the temple.
Okay, a little bit more on the Pharisees here. Now the Pharisees were believed to be the group that was most influential with the people, the normal people, the people who lived their daily lives, not associated with the aristocracy, not associated with the, um, with the temple, but those who really were there trying to figure out how to live God's life in, um, in, on a day-to-day -day basis. And they were, they're believed to have later developed into the rabbinic group, the Judaism that we know of today, the people of the book as they're called. As a group, the Pharisees seems to have emerged around the second century before Christ. And they were characteristically known for the study of the law and for an accurate and authoritative interpretations of the law. They did believe in the resurrection, the, soul, the life of the soul after death. This was a point of contention with the Sadducees because the Sadducees did not believe in the eternal life of the soul. Now, as a way of illustrating the Pharisees, they're also not necessarily a monolithic group. That There were different houses or schools of thought within Pharisaic Judaism. And just as an example, I have outlined here briefly two, an example of two schools of thought, two kind of, of the more extreme ones that we know were alive in the first century, probably around the time of Jesus as well. The house of Hillel, which characteristically when you read about their discussions about how to observe the Torah, how to apply the Torah to daily life situations, that they tend to be a little bit more lenient. The house of Shammai, in contrast, tends to be a little more strict. So, for example, um, our sources for this, by the way, are primarily in the Mishnah. The Mishnah, which is this wonderful compilation of the arguments that are put out by the different um, schools of thought, and they're arguing a particular point of living. For example, um, there will be a discussion over at what point should one say prayers. One characteristically says prayers of thanksgiving before one eats a meal, but what amount of food will constitute a meal? And there's a beautiful little discussion that happens about what amount of food is a meal. And the House of Hillel will say anything that is the size of an egg or larger constitutes a meal and then the prayer must be said. And the house of Shammai is much, says instead, no, 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 even something the size of an olive is considered a meal and also requires the prayer of thanksgiving. So the two schools of thought um, within Pharisaic Judaism are something that we want to kind of look at also as a way of understanding the Pharisees and particularly a way of understanding the concerns that are brought by the Pharisees to Jesus, as they're portrayed in the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels, you would think the Pharisees are the enemy. Um, now, one has to certainly make arguments for and against, and there is a certain legitimacy to Jesus' saying that they're paying so close attention to the law that they've forgotten the purpose of having the Torah. And they're only focused in on every little um, tit and tattle of the law rather than seeing the law for what it is, namely this place to have a relationship and love with um, God. The Pharisees are really working very hard to maintain that relationship by paying attention to every detail. So one can see both sides of the argument and one can certainly understand the great frustration that the Pharisees must have experienced in seeing this Jesus who's doing all kinds of things against the law um, and also putting forward a new meaning or a fuller meaning of what the law means as Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. So we want to see, um, put a little bit more in context than what the Pharisees' perspective might be and why what Jesus was doing and saying was so, for one thing, so radical, but also so important to really help us understand what is God's purpose in giving us these things, such as the Ten Commandments. Now, having um, these two ways, as a, just as an example, the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai, Shammai um, these two ways of understanding Torah is not just about two ways of looking at it, but it will end up, it can end up also having 
um, translate itself into purpose and actions with regarding to major pieces of Judaism that come into um, political play in um, the first century, anything regarding the temple, the land, or the lives of the people. So we have these two ways of thinking that maybe we can even see in the New Testament. And I have two examples here drawn from the Acts of the Apostles. Now this is not necessarily saying this represents the house of Hillel or house of Shammai, but it really represents more about their attitude. So the first one that I'd like to go through is the house, um, a way to think about the house of Hillel, whose basic attitude is live and let live. Let whoever rule the world as long as Jews can study and practice their Jewish law. And the setting that we can see for this is in Acts chapter 5. Um, and I have my Bible out here, here and I'm just going to start reading the passage a little bit. In Acts chapter 5, and this is um, the setting for... Uh, this is the setting for the disciples going into the various synagogues. Every time they go to a new city, synagogue, they go to, um, or they come to a new city, they go to the synagogue and they begin to preach what has happened in Jesus. And ter characteristically, they get tossed out. And here, we can witness one of these things where there's a major revolt and an uproar because of what has been spoken um, uh, by Peter and the apostles as they come into the synagogue. So starting in verse um, 33, after the preaching has happened with Peter. When they heard this, namely the crowds listening in the synagogue, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. And then he said to them, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be a somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and leave them alone, because if this plan or undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. So, here we have this example of where... Jews responding to the message from the apostles about Jesus have make are making choices right whether to to go after these men and physically hurt them or kill them or as is this Pharisee um, from Gamaliel is ascribing if their work is something that has God on their back then there's nothing that we can do to stop it and so if it is something that is only of a human origin, then it will die out on its own. So our job now is not to go after these men, but just to leave them. And we go and continue to focus on our life living Judaism as we understand it as Pharisees. Okay, so that's kind of the sense that we can see of represented by um, what the house of Hillel would do. Now, in contrast, the house of Shammai this would be a group that is far more zealous um, in keeping of the traditions and, and staying close to God and far more concerned with a greater detail. And we may have, we could think of them somewhat in terms of this example in Acts chapter 7. And in this example, we have here the stoning of Stephen. Again, it's the same kind of thing where the apostles are out and they're preaching something and then comes the reaction of the Jews um, to them. So verse 54, when they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet 
of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. And Saul approved of their killing him. So there we have this example, a more extreme form of reacting um, to or protecting uh, or how to live one's life according to Torah. So again, these two ways of observing the Torah, these two discussions that are happening within um, the different houses of um, the Pharisees, they have an outworking, they have a consequence in real life. And this particularly becomes so when a decision has to be made by these groups about what to do with the destruction of the temple in 70. This was such a major event because of the centrality of the temple and because of the understanding if the temple is destroyed, God's presence is destroyed in a certain way. And what is God trying to say to us as a people of Israel? It was such a cataclysmic event. And so one had to consider then as a Jew, what do we do next? Do we recapture Jerusalem from the Romans? Do we rebuild the temple? Do we try to throw off the Romans? How do we act now? For the house of Hillel, they would say, again, this is the group that um, has a much more inwardly focus, that the loss of that temple is still workable that they still have the Torah and they can enjoy God's presence through the study and prayer with Torah. Whereas the house of Shammai would still be pressing for that, perhaps that liberation of Israel or a house that is like that, that is much more zealous for it, um, for Israel. And this um, leads this kind of sense of liberation and we still need to overthrow the Romans and we need, we as humans need to act towards God's plan and do something about the Romans and the injustices that we live. It leads to a second revolt against the Romans called the Bar Kokhba revolt. It eventually gets squashed, the Romans squash them, but it was led by a man who was a very messianic type figure and had a great following drawn to him Simon Bar Kosiba. He was called Simon son of the star. So how the Jews then looked at their Judaism or looked at the following of Torah had consequences and what we might call very political outworkings in their daily life. So it's not something that we want to take um, lightly or we want to look at in a little bit more of an informed way when we're reading the encounters that Jesus has with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and why the point is being missed on the part of the Pharisees especially. Now we can think again, where is St. Paul in this? Because we just read the stoning of Stephen and the approval of Saul. And then what happens to the man who ends up becoming one of the most fervent preachers for Christianity, one of the most fervent aligners of himself, and just a man that is madly running up and down the uh, Mediterranean coast and starting all these new communities and keeping in touch with them and enduring all kinds of different things. Where can we see Paul in this? We have two clues. Um, we have the, pa or three clues actually. We have this passage from the Acts chapter 7. We have a self-description in the letter to the Galatians where Paul is getting ready to argue a main point around what it means to be faithful in Christ and how that plays itself out in this act of circumcision, to circumcise or not to circumcise. And we have a second description of him in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You could read these on your own, but they kind of describe how Paul was truly one of those zealous people and thought nothing of getting rid of those abominable Jews who were fighting for Christ, fighting for Jesus is the one that God had promised. Until, of course, Saul had his vision um, and was given the years of instruction um, uh, in his, when he was away in the desert. All this is described in um, that first part of uh, Galatians and referred to in the book of Acts. So, God's plan... St. Paul is really wonderful if, when you start to read his letters and begin to piece together his thinking. We can piece together much of what we also already know from the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd.
that there, God has this plan of salvation. And according to St. Paul, this plan includes Israel, who is this covenant people, who is to be this beacon of light for all people, um, and that through whom, then, through the people of Israel, specifically then through Jesus, God would undo that sin of Adam. Um, but because Israel was sinful at a certain part in her history, they, she went into exile for many years, returned from exile, and even though she had returned from exile and the temple was rebuilt, that this fulfillment of promises was not yet finished because there still had to be this restoration, that there had to be a Messiah that had to come in, and that all people had to be understanding and followers of God. And the covenant, of course, plays a very special role within all of this. So, um, with this in mind, again, I hope this is just a bit of a review.